For 60 years, scientists said fusion power was decades away. Until now. Imagine a team cracks electrostatic fusion, not in a sprawling lab, but inside a machine the size of a shipping container. Their breakthrough, real, verified, and impossibly small, promises boundless clean energy. But what if, instead of saving the grid, this victory turns the century-old power system against itself? In scientists cracked electrostatic fusion, and it might have just doomed the power grid, we reveal the experiment that could make every home energy independent, and why that might trigger a crisis nobody's truly prepared for. In the early 1960s, Philo Farnsworth, the same inventor who brought television into American living rooms, set out to tackle the puzzle of nuclear fusion. Working in a modest lab, he built a device unlike the mammoth machines favored by government research. Instead of using powerful magnets, his fuser relied on electric fields to pull charged atoms together. The result was a flash of light in a glass chamber, and, more importantly, a burst of neutrons, clear evidence that fusion had occurred. Farnsworth's original patent, filed in 1966, described a spherical grid system that could accelerate deuterium ions into a tiny central region. Even with limited funding and mounting skepticism from RCA executives, his team recorded neutron counts far above background, confirming that real fusion reactions were taking place. But the power needed to keep the device running always outweighed the energy it produced. The dream of net energy gain remained out of reach, and corporate support dried up. By 1967, Farnsworth's lab was shuttered, but the idea refused to die. Decades later, the fuser became the unlikely centerpiece of a global do-it-yourself movement. High school students, engineers, and retired physicists began assembling their own versions in garages and basements. Richard Hull, a veteran of the amateur community, chronicled years of trial and error, arcing wires, shattered glass, and the unmistakable ping of neutrons on a detector. Real science isn't just for billion-dollar labs, he wrote, after finally coaxing his device to fuse deuterium at home. Jackson Oswalt, a teenager in Tennessee, built his first working fuser at age 12. His online logs detail late-night troubleshooting and advice from the Fuser.net forums. Using diagrams and surplus parts, he managed to trigger fusion reactions, recording neutron emissions that matched those seen in professional labs. Hundreds of similar projects have popped up around the world, each one quietly verifying the same scientific principle. Fusion doesn't require a football field of machinery. It can happen on a workbench. Despite the modest scale, these home-built fusers have become a rite of passage for a new generation of experimenters. They don't generate useful power, but they do produce real fusion. Measured, repeatable, and impossible to fake. The science is settled. Electrostatic fusion works. What's missing is the leap from neutron flashes in a garage to a machine that powers a city. The question isn't whether the physics is real, it's whether anyone can finally tip the balance and make the reaction self-sustaining. Three-dimensional modeling has rewritten the rules for how scientists approach electrostatic fusion. What once took months of trial and error in a physical lab now unfolds overnight on a supercomputer. Electrode shapes, once limited to basic wire grids, are being sculpted in software, tested in virtual plasma, and optimized by algorithms that never tire. The latest generation of high-permittivity ceramics, forged in kilns hotter than volcanoes, can withstand voltages that would have shattered Farnsworth's original chambers. These materials allow researchers to push the electric field higher, holding plasma tighter and longer than ever before. At the heart of these advances is Dr. Elena Ruiz, a plasma physicist whose team at the National Fusion Institute has spent five years chasing what they call the Q threshold, the elusive point where energy out exceeds energy in. Ruiz's group doesn't just build prototypes, they train neural networks to run thousands of simulations, searching for the perfect pulse sequence to keep ions on target and minimize losses to the chamber walls. Their lab hums with the sound of vacuum pumps and the click of high-speed relays, each test run logged and analyzed by AI routines designed to spot patterns no human could see. Recent experiments have shattered old records for confinement time and voltage stability. Ruiz's team has managed to hold a deuterium plasma at 120 kilovolts for nearly 30 seconds, using a multi-layer ceramic grid that shrugs off the heat and stress. 
The device itself is no larger than a shipping container, its core shielded by a thick jacket of boron-infused polyethylene. Inside, a lattice of electrodes pulses in precise harmony, guided by real-time feedback from hundreds of embedded sensors. Every variable, gas pressure, voltage waveform, electrode temperature, is tracked and adjusted on the fly. The numbers are still short of the break-even point, but the gap is closing. Ruiz's simulations suggest that with one more leap, perhaps a new electrode alloy or an AI-discovered voltage protocol, the team could cross into net-positive territory. For the first time since Farnsworth's era, the idea of a compact, self-sustaining fusion reactor feels less like science fiction and more like an engineering puzzle with a solution just out of reach. If that breakthrough comes, it won't need a stadium-sized building. It could arrive in a device that fits on a truck, ready to plug into the world as we know it. Electric utilities have always relied on a simple formula, build giant power plants, invest billions in wires and substations, and recover those costs by charging customers for every kilowatt hour delivered. The bulk of a utility's expenses, often 60 to 70 percent, are fixed. These are the sunk costs of steel, concrete, transformers, and the salaries of thousands who keep the grid running. Regulators allow utilities to earn a set return on these investments, a system known as the rate base. For companies like Duke Energy or Southern Company, the rate base can top $60 billion. The math only works if millions of customers stay plugged in and keep paying their share, but the entire business model starts to unravel when customers don't need the grid anymore. The warning signs have already appeared in places with high rooftop solar adoption. In California, over 1.3 million homes now generate their own electricity. Pacific Gas and Electric reported losing more than $500 million a year as solar customers buy less power. The gap is made up by everyone else. Non-solar customers who see their bills climb as the fixed costs are spread over a shrinking base. The California Public Utilities Commission estimates that cost shifting from solar to non-solar ratepayers now totals nearly $1.7 billion annually. The pattern is clear. Each time a household defects from the grid, the burden on those who remain grows heavier. Utilities respond by raising rates or lobbying for higher fixed monthly charges. In Hawaii, where one in five homes has solar, the rate of customer loss forced emergency changes to net metering. Some utilities have proposed raising basic connection fees from $15 to $40 or even $70 a month just to cover infrastructure costs. But higher rates only accelerate the cycle. As bills rise, more customers look for ways out, whether through batteries, generators, or, if it becomes available, compact fusion. A utility executive, speaking at a closed-door industry conference, summed up the threat with a blunt warning. The grid wasn't designed to be optional, it was designed to be inevitable, and that's exactly why it's so vulnerable. The stakes are enormous. If a new technology like electrostatic fusion lets buildings or neighborhoods generate their own constant, reliable power, the traditional revenue model collapses. The fixed costs don't disappear when customers leave, they simply get divided among fewer and fewer people. This is the so-called death spiral. As revenue shrinks, rates go up, which drives even more defections until the system becomes unsustainable. Academic studies and consultancy reports echo the same conclusion. In states where distributed generation tops 10% of supply, utilities see retail sales growth drop to zero or go negative. Harvard and Berkeley researchers have found that if defections reach 15 to 20%, the financial model can tip into outright crisis. The Brattle Group, a leading energy consultancy, calculated that every 1% of customer loss can drive rates up by as much as 2%, compounding the problem. The grid's economic foundation is built on the assumption that everyone needs it. The moment that changes, the money unravels, and with it, the stability of the entire power system. When the American telephone network ruled every street and home, few imagined it could vanish. A T&T's monopoly once spanned millions of copper miles and a workforce the size of a small city. Yet in the 1980s, a court order forced the company to break apart. The world didn't just get cheaper long-distance calls, it got a new model of competition and a sudden glut of stranded infrastructure. Billions in copper wire, 
central office switches, and maintenance contracts lost their value almost overnight. Rural communities watched as landline service withered, replaced by cellular towers and, later, internet-based calls. The transition was chaotic. Some regions faced years of unreliable service as new providers scrambled to fill the void. The lesson was clear. When technology makes the old system optional, even a century-old institution can unravel in a decade. A generation later, the same pattern surfaced in the electric sector. Rooftop solar, once a niche for hobbyists, became mainstream in California by the early 2010s. Hearings at the state capitol turned into battlegrounds between utilities and solar advocates. Net metering policies, which let homeowners sell excess power back to the grid, became flashpoints. Utility executives warned of systemic cost unrecoverability, their term for a financial hole that only deepened as more customers installed panels. In 2021, official transcripts from the California Public Utilities Commission show utilities testifying that net metering had shifted $1.7 billion in costs annually onto non-solar customers. The response was to push for higher fixed monthly fees, sometimes as much as $40 or $70, just to stay connected. But each fee hike drove more defections as families invested in batteries and cut ties for good. Hawaii's grid faced its own reckoning. By 2018, one in five homes had solar. The grid operator struggled to balance surges of midday power with evening shortages, a phenomenon known as the duck curve. Utilities curtailed solar input to keep the system stable, but revenue losses forced emergency reforms to net metering. Even with changes, the basic problem persisted. Fixed costs for wires, poles, and maintenance didn't shrink when customers left. The more people left, the more expensive it became for those who stayed. Telecom and energy may seem worlds apart, but the underlying mechanics are strikingly similar. Both relied on everyone paying into a shared system. Both saw their economic foundations crumble when a new technology let users opt out. Internal memos from Bellcore in the 1990s predicted rate shock for rural customers as landline use collapsed, a warning now echoed in utility boardrooms and regulatory dockets across the country. Academic studies from Harvard and Berkeley show that when distributed energy reaches even 15% of supply, the utility business model can tip into crisis. The Brattle Group's analysis found that every 1% of customer loss can drive rates up by as much as 2%, compounding the exodus. For builders and experimenters, the lesson is sobering. The same drive that let a teenager in Tennessee build a fuser in his garage could, if scaled, trigger the kind of disruption that toppled telecom giants and upended the business of power. When a technology makes the grid optional, the speed of collapse can outpace even the boldest predictions. The story isn't just about new machines, it's about the fragility of systems built on the assumption that everyone needs them. Grid operators in Hawaii faced a dilemma as rooftop solar swept across the islands. By 2018, one in five homes had panels, flooding the system with midday power and leaving a gap at sunset. The result was the now infamous duck curve, a graph that dips low when solar output peaks, then rises sharply as evening demand returns. To keep the system balanced, operators were forced to curtail solar input, shutting off clean energy even as residents watched their bills climb. The fixed costs of maintaining wires, transformers, and backup generators did not shrink with each new rooftop array. Instead, those costs shifted onto the shrinking pool of customers still reliant on the grid. Hawaii's emergency reforms to net metering were a direct response to this operational strain, not just an economic calculation. Elsewhere, the grid's vulnerability shows up in different ways. In August 2003, a single tree branch brushing against a high voltage line in Ohio triggered a cascade of failures that left 50 million people without power across the Northeast and Midwest. Control rooms lost visibility as alarms stacked up, and within hours, entire cities went dark. Hospitals switched to backup generators. Water treatment plants stalled. The blackout cost the U.S. economy an estimated $6 billion in lost productivity and emergency response. Investigators later found that grid operators had little margin for error. A single missed alert could unravel the entire system. Even without new technology, 
the grid is stretched thin. Record heat waves strain transformers to the limit. Supply chain delays for replacement parts mean outages can last days, not hours. Utilities scramble to coordinate power flows from a patchwork of wind farms, gas plants, and aging nuclear stations. Every year brings new stress tests, from wildfires in California to ice storms in Texas. The system depends on constant vigilance and a delicate balance between supply and demand. Any disruption, whether from distributed solar, a line fault, or a hypothetical wave of fusion-powered homes, exposes cracks that have been widening for decades. The evidence is already visible. Curtailment orders in Hawaii, billion-dollar blackouts in the Northeast, and routine emergency alerts in states where the grid is running at the edge. These are not abstract warnings. They are operational realities that show just how fragile the backbone of modern life has become. Every part of a compact fusion generator, high-voltage insulators, vacuum pumps, control chips, relies on a supply chain that stretches across continents. Over half the world's high-voltage transformers and circuit breakers come from Chinese factories. Japanese and South Korean companies lead in ultra-high vacuum pumps and precision ceramics, while Europe supplies advanced control electronics. The United States, once a powerhouse in heavy electrical equipment, now depends on East Asia for most of its high-voltage gear. Department of Energy analysts warn that if fusion reactors shift from prototypes to mass production, this dependence could become a critical vulnerability. Geopolitical leverage and supply bottlenecks would not be solved quickly or easily. The complexity deepens with raw materials. Tantalum and tungsten, essential for electrodes that withstand plasma, are mined in Central Africa, but refining is dominated by Chinese and European firms. Semiconductors for plasma control are fabricated in Taiwan, then sent to assembly plants across Asia. Even boron, used for neutron shielding, is subject to price spikes as demand grows. For any nation aiming to localize fusion manufacturing, the timeline is daunting. Reshoring these supply chains would take years and require massive investments in new plants, workforce training, and reserves of rare materials. Fuel logistics introduce another layer of risk. Deuterium, the main fuel for fusion, is plentiful. Each cubic meter of seawater holds about 33 grams, enough to power a city for days. Extraction is straightforward, and global reserves are virtually unlimited. Tritium, however, is scarce and tightly controlled. The world's civilian stockpile is under 30 kilograms, mostly in Canada. Widespread fusion power would demand breeding tritium from lithium, a process not yet proven at scale. National laboratories and energy ministries have flagged this as a major vulnerability, with implications for both energy security and non-proliferation. Utility executives and security officials are already uneasy. If future fusion reactors are built in China, who holds the switch? If tritium supply chains are disrupted, could entire regions face energy blackmail? The arrival of millions of small, powerful generators promises resilience, but also raises new risks. The stakes have shifted from economics to strategy, security, and survival. In 1964, Philo Farnsworth's lab notes confirmed the first successful fusion reactions achieved with a device small enough to fit on a workbench. Six decades later, not a single electrostatic fusion machine has produced more energy than it consumes, a fact documented in every peer-reviewed review to date. Yet, as this film has shown, advances in materials, computational modeling, and control systems are closing the gap. The economic record is clear. When disruptive technology reaches mass adoption, infrastructure built on old assumptions can unravel quickly, as seen with landline telephones and the rise of rooftop solar. But crucial questions remain. No published design has reached net energy. National security and regulatory roadmaps for widespread fusion are still unwritten. The U.S. grid, built for giant plants, remains vulnerable to both technological leaps and global supply chains. As deuterium reserves in seawater promise near limitless fuel, society faces a choice, adapt its institutions or risk repeating the mistakes of past transitions. The evidence points to a simple reality. Electrostatic fusion is no longer just science fiction, and the challenge now is preparing for its consequences.